Well, welcome to episode 84 of the Family Ant Man podcast. Today, we're talking about the importance of meeting your spouse's needs from a biblical worldview on the Family Ant Man podcast. I'm your host, David Ortiz, and I'm here with Dr. Mark Crosby. Uh, he is a pastor, educator, marriage and family therapist, and our resident expert here on the Family Ant Man podcast, where we tackle tough questions that families face and discuss practical solutions that really do work. Now, this podcast is not a therapy session. We're not able to give specific advice to your unique circumstances, but we do believe that mental and spiritual health are very serious issues and that family dynamics can be and often are very complicated. So for in-depth answers to your questions, we encourage you to seek professional counsel specific to your unique circumstances. Now, if you would take a second right now to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, rate and review us, uh, hit the notification bell so you never miss an episode of the Family Ants Man. Uh, and if you are listening on a podcast, uh, please follow us, rate us, review us again on your favorite podcast app. It really does help us out. Uh, we appreciate that a lot. And if our content has helped you at all, uh, we wanna invite you to uh, invite your family to join the Family Answer Man and that you would share this podcast with them so they can join you on this journey of building stronger, healthier, happier families. Well, Dr. Mark, it is good to be here with you today. Yes. And uh, we have a great topic for uh, the middle of February. Right. It is Valentine's uh, Day, Valentine's Week. And, uh, and the topic of love, marriage, relationships, uh, how to do better in those things yeah. often come up at this time of year. Yes, indeed. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about the importance of meeting your spouse's needs. Yeah. Uh, is that something that uh, in your experience as a pastor, as a uh, counselor, as a husband, uh, is that something that comes natural for, pe for people or is this something that uh, is a learned um, skill right. set? right. Yeah, I think, you know, we would like to think it comes natural, but it doesn't. Um, the reality is that so many of us get caught up in what I call the day-to-day -day survival mode of life. Yeah. And, and that's understandable, and that's fine. I mean, we have to work, make a living, pay our bills, raise our children, get them to school, make the bed, you know, clean the dishes, prepare the meals, you know, cut the grass. There's a lot that goes into all it. All that goes yep. with life and living. But in all of that, what happens is, I think we sometimes forget that we got married uh, to have certain needs met in our life and to meet the needs of someone else in our life. And sometimes in all of the hustle and bustle of life, with all of the responsibilities of life, we sometimes forget that our primary responsibility is meeting the need of our spouse. Uh, we've talked about that before, that importance of making that our priority. Mm -hmm. And when we don't, things begin to fall apart. And so I think it does not come natural because I think, again, for most of us, we were raised in a home where, hey, as long as we're, you know, putting food on the table, roof over our head, getting our kids to school, you know, maybe doing some vacation a couple of times a year, then we have done our due. And those are important things. And I'm not, you know, negating the importance of, of these things. However, the reality is that life and marriage is far more than that. And it's a daily understanding of meeting needs, a daily understanding of having your needs being met. Because when we don't, that's when things begin to unravel and fall apart. Yeah. And I know uh, over time, those things, uh, issues that are left unaddressed right. often become uh, some of the highlights of the things that we struggle with. That's right. And so that is, I think, a good segue to our question for the day. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, if somebody wants to get in touch with us, uh, they can. They can email us familyanswerman at liveoak.church, familyanswerman at liveoak.church right. is our email address to ask your questions. Uh, the question that came in today says, my wife and I have been married for seven years. Okay. I work hard, provide a nice home. She drives a new car. And she has all the freedoms and opportunities that anyone should want. Yet, I don't feel that that's enough. She doesn't seem content. Right. What am I missing? Yeah, so what's happening here, it sounds like, is that, I mean, this husband is doing what most husbands feel they are called to do. I'm going to work hard, make a nice living, try to provide a nice home, give my, my wife a new car. And she should be content with those things. And I'm not saying that she's not necessarily. I'm not saying most people would not be content with those things. But most of us, after seven years of marriage, realize one thing, that things are nice, but they don't meet all of our needs. Yeah. I've been a lot of people over the years who have said, I would rather live, you know, in a one-room shack and be loved unconditionally by my spouse, uh, have just a little 
bit of food and a little bit of opportunity, but have this amazing relationship than live in a mansion and have all of the amenities the world could offer, but not have a good relationship. Yeah. And the Word of God, I think, speaks to that. You know, the Word of God, I think, you know, uh, makes that same claim. That, you know, I think there's one verse that says it's better to be uh, in the attic with a few vegetables than be in a mansion with a contentious person. Uh, <laughs> and so anyway, this is, this is something that we, I think, all, again, begin to realize, recognize. Dr. William Glasser... I quote him often because I think he's one of the greatest psychologists or psychiatrists, I should say, of the 20th century. He declared that the key to contentment and the key to satisfaction is to have your needs met. And Dr. Glasser built an entire theory on the power and the importance of meeting the need of one another. Uh, Dr. Glasser uh, borrowed a little bit from uh, Maslow when he said that there are five basic needs that we all need to be aware of. The first one I think most of us recognize, the first one most of us in America have, and that is the basics of food, clothing, shelter, you know, water, that sort of thing. I think most of us in America, and of course there's some exceptions, of course, but most of us in America have food, clothing, shelter, water. And so that, that needs being met. But he said the next need, need is to be met is the need to be loved. Mm. And so many times we miss that one, uh, the need to love and to be loved. He said that is a very important need uh, that we have. He said the third need is to have a sense of power and control over self. Have a sense of, you know, I'm in control. No one's controlling me. I have some power. No one has power over me. Uh, the fourth need is the need for freedom. Uh, the freedom to do and be all that God has called us to do or be. And then the fifth one, interestingly enough, is to have fun. Hmm. The power of the importance of fun. So he says, basically, when those needs are being met, having our basic, you know, uh, essential needs, food, clothing, water, whatever, love, power and control over our life, freedom and fun, when those needs are being met, he says, for the most part, life is good. But when one of those needs are missing, when one of those needs are not being met, he said, that's when things become problematic in our life. Now, when you take that and you fine tune that for our wives, you know, so here this man is writing in saying, my wife has a house, she has a new car, she has freedom, she has opportunities, but she doesn't seem content. Then that for me is a red flag that says something is not being met that's important to her. Right. And you can go back to the list. Right. And so the point is, is that most wives have universal needs they hoped that they would find in their marriage. Okay. And so here are some of the basic universal needs. We've talked about these before, but just for those who need a little review or those who haven't heard, there are, there are about four or five basic universal needs that every wife has. Number one, we said before, is the need for security. Uh, and that is seen, uh, again, first of all, in the sacrifice of the husband. So when a husband is sacrificing for his wife and a husband is putting basically her needs above his needs, mm, yeah. then that gives a sense of security to a wife. When a wife does not have to beg uh, for her husband's attention or affection, uh, when there's not a hobby more important than her, uh, then she begins to feel valued by her husband. So again, here's the point. If a husband is selfish and detached from her needs, then she won't feel secure. And that's okay. important to note. And so therefore, husbands are called, I will, I will argue, to be sensitive to their wife's needs. And that's very crucial for a happy marriage. Uh, again, your wife should never have to beg or compete for your love, for your affection, or for your attention. So that's the first thing. A wife needs to feel a sense of security. Uh, the second basic need is what I call soft affection. Uh, most wives really want and desire and need that emotional, soft, gentle connection uh, from their husband. Uh, there's an old saying, you know, back in the 80s and 90s that we used to say that uh, women are pretty much like crockpots. Okay. And men are like microwave ovens <laughs> when it comes to affection. Okay, that, you, you know, uh, can, women can need make a, some dots there. Yeah, yeah, women women need that slow, you know, continually all day mm -hmm. build up so that the romantic moment can be uh, very exciting, very meaningful. Whereas a man, a microwave oven, put it on sixty seconds, hit the button, and you're ready to go. And so, uh, but the point is that if you're going to meet the need of your wife, she needs that soft affection. That hold, holding her, that hugging her, that caressing, that soft, gentle approach. And the problem is, though, men struggle with this. Right. Um, but again, when, when a man struggles with this, 
uh, and he doesn't offer this, then what he's communicating to his wife is that she is simply an object to him. Mm. She's an object of his satisfaction. She's an object, you know, of simply his wants and desires. And a lot of women, unfortunately, push back against that. They don't want to be just an object of one's affection or just an object of one's desire. They want to know that behind all of the romance, there is love. Behind all the romance, there is care. Behind all the romance, there's a sense of faithfulness and loyalty uh, and valuing, again, who she is as a person. And so when a man treats her like an object over time, then she begins to lose that sense of feeling valued. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the great, I think, concerns and needs you see across the board when it comes to husbands and wives, especially after five, six, seven years as the person in this question who says, I've given my wife all these things and she still doesn't seem to feel content. Uh, A third need is a sense of talking, sharing, communication, every how you want to put it, where the man actually opens his heart to his wife. Uh, I had a colleague not that long ago say, he said, you know, my wife and I, we would sit down after dinner, you know, or after work, and maybe at dinner, talk about the generic things of life. How are the kids doing? You know, how's your mama doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, you know, what came in the mail today? What bills have to be paid? Mm-hmm. You know, and they just talked about the, the generic things of life. And he said, we did that for, for years. He said, then finally, my wife said, we need to get beyond just the generic. Mm. And so she basically brought him into the living room and said, I want to hear about you. I want to hear what's going on inside of you. Uh, I want you to hear what's going on inside of me. I want to hear about what's been happening in your life, in your world, you know, what happened that's troubling you. I, I want you to hear, you know, my conversation that I had with, you know, our, our middle daughter or whatever. And they began to really then talk mm-hmm. from the heart. Uh, and again, be able and willing to share really what's happening in their world, what they've been thinking about, their hopes, dreams, fears, whatever that may be. But when you open your heart to her, you're now reaching a level of, of romance, a level of intimacy, if you will, on a verbal level that, again, draws you and connects you to, to your spouse. Uh, as one person put it, be more than what you feel. Hmm. Be more than what you feel. Be more than what you feel. What that means is this. You may not feel like fill in the blank, but you do it anyway. Mm. You may not feel like talking, but you do. You may not feel like being romantic, but you are. You may not feel like going to the gym, (laughs) but you do. (laughs) You may not feel like being on a diet, but you do. Mm. In other words, when you, again, are more than what you feel, then what happens is you are now placing yourself in this sense of being a servant leader, which we're about to talk about, and being very sensitive to where your wife is and what she wants and desires. We'll talk about taking control back over your own life, not being controlled by your feelings and what you feel at the moment, but taking control of those things. Right, and realizing that life's not about you Mm -hmm. and that you're called to be more than what you feel. Uh, And we all know this. Not everybody feels like going to work. Not everybody feels (laughs) like going to church sometimes. Not everybody feels like, you know, uh, exercising that everyone mm-hmm. feels like you know getting out in the rain but the reality is when you do more than what you feel then life gets a whole lot better mm-hmm. we mentioned the servant leadership most wives want their husbands to be that servant leader that means that as the husband you be the loving initiator in the home mm-hmm. You be the loving initiator. What that means is this. There's four primary areas where most wives want their husbands to be this loving initiator. Number one, children. Uh, Children are going to have problems. They're going to have concerns. They're going to have problems at school. They're going to have problems on the ball team, in their neighborhood, with bullies, whatever that may be. And the reality is that most wives want the husband to be the loving initiator as far as how to solve this problem, how to face this issue. What can we do? What needs to be done? What, need, what do we need to change? Uh, and so when a husband is a loving initiator, not the domineering tyrant, this is what we're going to do, pounding his fist against the desk or whatever, and you know the wife being the doormat, that's not you know, what we're looking at. We're being this loving initiator. Let me be the person that first analyzes the problem. Let me be the person who first gives a solution. 
Let me be the person that first unpacks what I think is going on here. And so most wives love it when their husband is this loving initiator, this servant leader. So children, number two, finances. Most wives want the husband to be this loving initiator when it comes to finances. Uh, how can we save more money? How can we get out of debt? How can we, you know, cut some corners? What do we, what, you know, do we need to do to start saving for more retirement or whatever it may be? But this loving initiator. Uh, another, another area is the area of spiritual matters. You know, most uh, husbands and uh, want to, uh, most wives want their husbands to be that spiritual leader. But what does that mean? What does that look like? And often what that means is, you know, uh, making sure that people are encouraged in the family uh, to go to church on Sunday morning or to come to Bible study or to pray over the meal or to invite someone to church or to be a part of that mission project or whatever a person may be may be dealing with. And so so these are just some areas, I think, that are very important that we need to note uh, that the husband needs to be that loving initiator. A loving initiator also means that you begin the conversation about the problem. Mm. You start the conversation. You offer the solution. Uh, you analyze your options. Uh, you're not passive, nor are you dominating, but you make decisions with her. And I yeah. think so many times a, a husband is going to get in one of two extremes. Right. You know, they're the passive person. You handle the kids. You pay the bills. You handle the finances. Um, you want to go to church, you find a church and I'll show up, you know. Right. And, and yeah. that's not being the, the servant leader. Hmm. That's not being the loving initi initiator. So they're many times are often passive when it comes to these areas. Or on the flip side, they're dominating. Right. I'm going to tell you how to handle this problem. I'm going to tell you how we're going to spend our money. I'm going to tell you, you know, where the kids go to school. I'm going to tell you where we go to church. I'm going to tell you how to dress. That's uh, the Pharaoh, right? Let it be, let it be written. Let it be so. What I say goes. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and so, and most wives that I know, <laughs> don't they, like that either. They, they don't, right. they don't embrace that. You nor, know? nor do men, nor do husbands to be fair. Right, right, right. right. As my daddy said, that dog don't hunt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that dog won't hunt. That ship won't sail. But anyway, the point is, is that, the, re the reality is that, you know, these are the extremes that so many men begin to take on. So here, here's the point. Uh, our problems are not always about what is wrong or what is right. Hmm. But recognizing how we see the problem and recognizing how we see each other and how recognizing how we see our kids and how different that is. In other words, the problem is not always this is right, this is wrong. The problem often is we are different in how we view things, uh, maybe because of our upbringing, maybe because of our family of origin, of course, maybe because of experiences in life. Mm -hmm. But but as I've heard you know, so many of my colleagues say, it's not about right or wrong. Sometimes it's between, you know, pink and blue. In other words, the male sees things from a male perspective, yeah. from a dad's perspective, you know, I want my son to be, you know, stronger, better. I want my daughter to be prettier and kinder and whatever. And then the wife is, you know, maybe taking a different perspective as she sees the kids. You know, I want my son to be more of a gentleman. I want him to be, you know, less aggressive. And the dad's going, absolutely not. You know, if anybody <laughs> comes against you, you let them know who's boss or whatever. And so, yeah. so, it's, so it's not a matter of right or wrong as much as it is different. And that really should be freeing to know that a lot of the conflict that we have in marriage is not right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just just different difference. Wow. Know, it, it's it's pink and blue. Yeah, wow, you know? that's really good. And, and 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 I think I think the so so with that being said, with that being said, when it's right or wrong, the argument begins to come into the marriage of I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, I'm going to argue you down so you can see how right I am and how wrong you are. But if we <laughs> simply approach our differences uh, that way. Let me kind of give you my perspective as to why I'm in this situation or why I see it this way or why I, you know, feel very strongly about this. And then pause and be willing to listen to where the other one's coming from. Right. You know, and then somewhere between the pink and the blue, there is a happy medium. Well, and the fact that it's not right or wrong makes compromise so much more oh, yeah. palatable. Right, right. And, and, and because the reality is, you know, a very basic psychological principle is no one wants to be wrong. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, no, no one wants to be wrong. And what will happen is even mm -hmm. if we start to be convinced that we are wrong, we don't want to be wrong. Right. And so we will stand on our particular platform and keep, you know, 
preaching away, saying how right we are when down deep we realize, you know what, maybe we're wrong. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, so, wow. it's, so it's hard to surrender. It's hard to wave that white flag. It's hard to say I was wrong. But when you look at it as, no, it's not right or wrong. I'm just blue. You're just pink. We're seeing this from different perspectives. Where can we find the happy medium? Now you have something that begins to work with you and work for you. So again, so how we overcome these differences, therefore, is crucial as we begin to look at, again, the needs of one another, the needs of our children, the needs of our, our home, uh, the financial uh, concerns that we may have. See, I think our biggest problem uh, is simply this. And I think we're all guilty of this. We've been married more than, you know, three days. Uh, you, you'll understand what I'm about to say. And that is our biggest problem is that we want our spouse to look like us. Yes. We want them to look like us. We want them to think like us. We want them to express love like us. We want them to receive love like us. We want them to see children like us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is, as I had one colleague say, unless your wife was raised in the same home as you, <laughs> then the chances are pretty small they're going to think like you, see the world right. like you, etc. Uh, now, again, the good news is that sometimes we will you know, find someone, marry someone or whatever, or someone will begin to realize. And, and again, we're attracted to those people who may see things similar to the way we do. Mm -hmm. So being a little facetious. But the reality is that our biggest problem is that we want our spouse to see things just like we do. And we want them to think like we do. And that's not always the case. And it shouldn't be. Because, again, right. it's good to have that balance. It's yeah. good to have that different perspective. So, again, but the point is this. When we want our spouse to think like us, to talk like us, to look like us, to be like us, then that's when we miss out on our spouse's needs. Mm. Okay, because that's when we begin to, to forget just how important their needs are and how important it is that I meet those needs and what those needs are. So anyway, the reality is that... Uh, the, the, the primary point is that needs are very, very important. We're called to meet those needs because of this very reason. When you reject your spouse's needs, in many ways, they take on the concern or the feeling that you're rejecting them. Mm. So when you reject your spouse's needs, in many ways, you're rejecting them. Wow. And the last thing anybody wants, the last thing anybody needs, the last thing anybody desires is to feel rejected, right. especially by their spouse. So the thing is, is that uh, I know our listening audience is, is hearing about meeting the needs of the wife, but I guarantee you on this Valentine week, and for those who are listening on our podcast and on the radio, there's a few men out there going, what about my needs? <laughs> So we're going to take just a brief few moments in the closing moments of our uh, of our show here. And we're going to talk a little bit about meeting the needs of, of the man. So, so ladies, if you've been cheering us on for the last few moments uh, and you've been giving us the attaboys and high fiving us, you know, there in your car as you're traveling home from work or whatever, uh, I do want you to pay attention now about the needs of your husband, uh, because here's the thing. Here's what men want from life, and, and, and this is pretty universal, but men want four primary things from life. They want to feel a sense of identity. They want to know who they are. In many ways, what a man does is who he is. Mm -hmm. And yes. so if a man likes what he does, then he will like, in many cases, who he is. But if a man is working a job and that he doesn't like, he will sometimes not like his identity. Right. So identity is very important to, to a lot of men. Ask most little boys when they're seven, eight, nine years old, what do you want to do? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, you're basically equating what they want to do with who they are. Yes. I want to be you know, a policeman. I want to mm -hmm. be a pastor. I want to be a doctor. I want to be you know, an accountant, whatever it may be, because who I am is what I do, and what I do is who I am. So identity is very important. Uh, secondly, for most men, what they want from life is purpose. I want a sense of purpose in my life. I want to know that what I'm doing makes a difference. I want to know that where I am and what I'm, where I'm going makes a difference. Uh, thirdly, they want a sense of achievement. 
they want to look back over life and look at what all they've accomplished. This is why, you know, there's trophy cases and this is why there's, you know, bulletin boards full of things that they have said and done. This is why they, you know, have the ribbons from their ninth grade track meet, you know, uh, hanging up uh, there in the kitchen. So, (laughs) so achievements are important. And the very, and the fourth thing is acceptance. Yeah. Um, they want to be accepted by their peers and be accepted by their colleagues and be accepted by their family members and be accepted by, you know, the, the local group, whatever that may look like. And so identity, purpose, achievement, and acceptance are the four thing, four things that men want from life. But from their wife, there are four things they want from their wife as well. It's very important to note. And the first thing is a sense of affection. Most men desire affection. Most men's love language, we said this before, is physical touch, um, romantic intimacy. Most men are loved uh, or feel loved when their wife is being very affectionate. So ladies, uh, it's Valentine's week. This would be a great week, you know, to show uh, your husband that you love him through affection. Uh, The second thing most men want is a sense of admiration. Uh, Most men want someone to cheer them on, to see them uh, for their accomplishments, to admire them for who they are, for to admire them for their skills in life, to admire them for what they have achieved or what they've accomplished, et cetera. And most men love that admiration. Most men love, again, getting the award. You know, um, this week, you know, we just had the Super Bowl, you know, and so people want to be admired for winning and being the champion and all these things. So again, admiration is very important. Uh, a third thing that men want from their wife is a sense of appreciation. Uh, and sometimes we don't give out the appreciation in our homes right. the way I think we need to yep. or as much as we need to. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate everybody else. Right. You see it, that in business. You see it at you know, work and everywhere you, else around us. You yeah. get thank you mm-hmm. notes. You get all these things, which are very important. Words, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. You know, people are appreciating you mm-hmm. for all the things, the, the big things, the little things. But sometimes as wives, you know, there's just a sense of, well, that's what, she's, what he's supposed to do. You know, I got to thank him for everything. I got to thank him for everything. Right, right. Well, you don't have to thank him for everything, but most men want nice. yeah. some appreciation. Right. And ladies, the more you show appreciation, here's a, a, a little, little, little news flash: the more he's going to want to do it. Yes. You know, yeah. uh, and then the fourth thing most men want is they want attention. They just want to uh, know that, you know, you see them, that they're in the same room with you, that you acknowledge that they're there and that you give them that sense of attention. So, uh, again, affection, admiration, appreciation and attention. Here's the bottom line. When there are two people who are in love, who are willing to serve the other person, then that creates a slice of heaven on earth. When there are two people who are in love, who are saying that your needs are more important than my needs. I'm going to serve you because I think you're more important than I am. And the other one says, no, 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 absolutely not. You're more important than I am. And you have these two people wanting to be sensitive to the need of one another and wanting to meet those needs and striving to meet those needs on a daily basis or or daily basis, weekly basis, but something that, again, is happening on an ongoing basis, then amazing things begin to happen with that couple. But what I'll also say is this, if you have two people who are the chiefs or managers and they are demanding and expecting and saying all these things uh, where you feel like the doormat or you feel like the other person is a tyrant, things begin to break down. So two servants in love can create a slice of heaven as they meet the needs of one another. Well, there you have it from the family answer man himself. Uh, remember to meet your wife's needs. Remember to meet your husband's needs and, uh, and strive to be those two people in love and create that slice of heaven here on earth in your home. Uh, we do hope that this episode of the family answer man, uh, has been helpful to you. Um, I would encourage you to share it with your family and your friends. Uh, As always, thank you to uh, Days Smokehouse and Special Meats and Winter's Air for underwriting our show. And uh, as always, this is not a therapy session and we're not able to give specific advice to your situation, but we do hope that this episode of The Family Answer Man will lead you to have stronger, healthier, happier families.